For as long as I can remember, my mother has served in some capacity in the church. She returned to full-time parish ministry when I was in college and has been there ever since. But prior to that, she'd take on all kinds of volunteer roles in the congregation. But the one role where I always remember standing and looking at her, thinking, this is what my mother was made to do, was when she would lead the drama portion of Vacation Bible School for one week every summer. My mother was always the narrator of whatever drama was going on, mostly so in case it veered off course, she could veer it back. But she did it with such energy and flair and humor that you were easily transported into the scripture story being told that morning. And with my mother in charge, I was given many opportunities to hone my acting skills in VBS dramas, as well as many opportunities to assist as prop master during my free time at home. I remember the year that Bobo the Wonder Horse, a gift that I had been given as a very small child, was transformed into the golden half calf with the help of an entire roll of gold foil. I remember the year I helped make angel wings out of refrigerator boxes and white fabric scraps that my mother had collected from the dumpster behind Joanne Fabrics. And I remember the years I was asked to play roles like Miriam as I sent my baby brother down the river in a basket, or as a mighty guard atop the wall of Jericho with swim floaties on my arms to make muscles out of scrawny adolescent arms. I remember older saints of the church who would show up each morning of VBS to play Naaman or Eli or King Saul or Goliath. And I remember saints like Linda Longfield who always possessed a knack for turning any Bible story into a song. Occasionally that effort turned into how many words can we squeeze into the next five notes, but nonetheless. We were singing those songs again and again. I was learning scripture, and I was learning the stories contained within it, both in drama and in song. Repeating these stories again and again and again until I knew them by heart. It was without question on those sticky wooden pews in the unair conditioned sanctuary in Dubuque, Iowa, for one week each summer where my faith formation found its roots where those verses and stories were rehearsed again and again and again until they dwelled deep within my soul. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Thanks to years of singing these words at Vacation Bible School, this text from Deuteronomy is as familiar to me as my own name. What was not as familiar, however, were the powerful words that followed this text in Deuteronomy. Keep these words close to your heart. Recite them to your children and your children's children. Talk about them at home and when you are away, when you lie down at night and when you rise in the morning. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, write them on the doorposts of your house. In other words, whatever it takes to know these words in every fiber of your being, do that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Known as the Shema in Jewish culture, these words from Deuteronomy stand at the center of the Jewish faith. The Shema is perhaps as familiar to the average Jew as the Lord's Prayer is to the average Christian, and it is recited two times a day by observant Jews. It is often the first prayer that Jewish children learn, and it becomes part of the daily ritual practice until these words dwell deeply within the one who speaks them. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus knew these words well, too. He likely didn't learn them at Vacation Bible School the way I did, but he said them and perhaps even 
saying them often enough that they dwell deeply in his soul as well. However, when the scribe turned to him that day, the scribe asked a question, and the scribe knew when he asked that question that there were over 600 commandments in the Jewish faith that Jesus could choose from. But the scribe wanted him to pick one. Which commandment is first of all? And Jesus answered with this scripture from Deuteronomy. The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then he went on to quote Leviticus. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. You're correct responded the scribe. There is nothing more important than these. They are much more important than any burnt offering or sacrifice we could ever make. Love God, love neighbor. You are not far from the kingdom, Jesus replied, not too far at all. Now I want us to pause for just a second and look at Jesus' response to this scribe. Keep in mind, the scribe asked for one commandment, Jesus gave two, and the scribe could have easily given him a hard time for this, but I think the scribe knew what he was saying. In offering both of these commandments from Holy Scripture, Jesus communicates they are inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. Love for neighbor is intimately tied with love for God, just as love for God is intimately tied to love of neighbor. And remember, love in Jesus' time was not what we know love to be today. Today, love has become a hallmarky, rom-com, good feelings kind of love. But in Jesus' time, love demanded action. Love was action. If you wanted to demonstrate your love for God or your love for neighbor, it was going to require far more of you than your thoughts and prayers and good feelings. In fact, every translation of this text, whether in Greek or Hebrew, because it's in Deuteronomy, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this text is in all of these places, and all of them, even if there are little nuances and variances between them, they all reinforce absolute personal devotion to God. To love God and neighbor with absolutely every facet of your life. The central commandments of our faith. Jesus said this is what is most important. We recite them again and again, and they insist that we are to love God and neighbor with everything that we are and everything that we have. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I also don't think it was an accident that Jesus pointed to this text in Deuteronomy that was followed by these commands. Keep these words close to your heart. Recite them to your children and to your children's children. Talk about them at home and when you are away. Talk about them when you lie down at night and when you rise in the morning. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house. Whatever it takes to know these words in every fiber of your being. Do that. For in that ritual, in that constant reminder, these commandments will become second nature to you. They will become instinctual. They will become your natural way of living and being in the world, and they will guide your way when you've lost it. You shall love the Lord your God with all that you are and all that you have and all that you possess in this world. And you shall love not out of obligation or duty, but in thanksgiving for the incredible gift of love that God has given to you. For as we were already reminded today, we love only because God first loved us. You have the ability to love because from the very beginning of creation, before words could ever be formed in your mouth, 
to express love to God, God loved each and every one of you. God has always loved you. God will always love you. And thus, you are called to love your neighbor as yourself and to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind and anything else you can possibly think of. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul who wrote to the Roman church and informed them that the only good and right response to God's gift of grace was for your entire life to be a sacrifice to God. Every part of your life, the public, the private, the political, the financial, the spiritual, the physical, the emotional, the intellectual, all of it, all of it should be offered to God freely and joyfully. And all of it should be a means through which you love God and love your neighbor. For the gifts you know in this life, the talents you have been given that have allowed you to succeed, the resources you possess in your bank account, the friends and family you call beloved, none of these gifts have ever been yours to claim. They have only ever been gifts given to you by God, gifts entrusted to your care that you might live faithfully in this world as a caretaker of those gifts, seeking with all that you are and all that you have to love God and love neighbor. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Last week, I had the privilege of traveling to Kansas City with a small group of clergy that I meet with each year. And we met with Roger, who's a professor and pastor who serves at a local church outside Kansas City. And Roger shared with us about a conversation he had some years ago with a high-ranking military officer who was working in the Presbyterian Mission Agency at the time. And they were talking about faith formation together. And the officer said to him, Roger, do you know why we drill in the military? Do you know why we do the same thing over and over and over again? It's so that when we're in a war zone and all hell breaks loose, our reaction to that terror will be the drills that we have done again and again and again. They will be our natural instinct. They will be second nature because every fiber of our being has memorized these drills by heart. This is why we drill. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Keep these words close to your heart. Recite them to your children and your children's children. Talk about them at home and when you are away, when you lie down at night and when you rise in the morning. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house, whatever it takes to know these words in every fiber of your being. Do you know why we drill? We drill because we're going to start to believe these words if we do. We're going to start to live these words if we do, and not merely with one part of our life or with whatever we have left to give, but with everything that we are and everything that we have and the best that we have to give. And we drill because when we look around our world, and neo-Nazis are marching, and thousands have lost everything in hurricanes, and people are slaughtered by automatic weapons at a music festival, and it feels like all hell is breaking loose. Our reaction to that terror will not be helplessness and hopelessness and fear, but rather our reaction to that terror will be the words that we have spoken the words that we have lived again and again and again. Hear, O Israel, 
The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, there has perhaps never been a more crucial time for the church to believe and to live these words than this very day. For in the midst of the darkness, God calls you and me to be a witness to the light. To love God and neighbor with everything we are and everything we have. It is in this time of abundant darkness that God, more than ever, is calling us to be the church. As I mentioned before, I had the gift of spending time in Kansas City with five other pastors. And at one point, Roger turned to each of us, and he asked us the same questions I will ask each of you today. Will you be able to stand before God one day and say, I have loved you with my whole self, body, mind, soul, spirit, with my professional life, with my personal life, with my finances, with my political convictions? Will you be able to stand before God one day and confidently proclaim that you have done everything you could to love your neighbor, whether that neighbor was a friend or an enemy or a stranger? Will you be able to stand before God one day and say, yes, God, I have lived this life with your commandments on my heart. I have recited them to my children and to my children's children. I have talked about them when I have been home, when I've been away, when I lie down and when I rise in the morning. I have bound them as a sign on my head and fixed them as an emblem on my forehead. I have written them on the doorposts of my house, and I have shared your love with every person I have ever known. I have lived my entire life as a prayer of thanksgiving to you with all that I am and all that I have. If that is the testimony that you can give when you stand before God, then let the church shout an abundant amen. But if it's not, if this is not the testimony you can give, I know it's not the testimony I can give, if there are fears or anxieties that keep you from loving God and neighbor with all that you are and all that you have, then my friends, you have work to do. We have work to do. And this is why we drill. Here, O oh, Morrisville Presbyterian Church, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your heart. You shall love the 